Let us engage in prayer. Oh, God, how we do rejoice that thou art a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. Here we are in a course studying about thee, and thou hast given us a textbook written by thee, and as an aid in the understanding of it, thy Holy Spirit who inspired it, and yet we have so great need in addition. What a privilege it is to come to the author of that book and to invoke thee, O God, for help in the understanding and presentation of it, and to be assured that thou wilt hear our importunate petition far beyond anything we can even imagine. So help us to be on the alert to see the way in which thou dost answer beyond our thinking the prayers of our lips. In Christ's name, amen. We talk now uh, about prayer as the introduction to a study of the Lord's Prayer while we continue with the theme of sanctification. Number one, in his word, God speaks to man. This is the wonder of our course. Those of you uh, uh, present for this, I'm sure, have listened to many other series of lectures on uh, religion, but also probably on botany and zoology and economics and philosophy and mathematics and business, homemaking. Every conceivable subject has been mastered by certain men and women, and they communicate their specialized knowledge to the rest of us lay people. But in this particular field, where I have the privilege of lecturing right now, we have a unique textbook, one written by God himself. No other study enjoys that privilege. As a matter of fact, there, you sometimes see jokes about students in science classes who are rushing to the bookstore to buy the book before it's out of date. The developments in certain fields are so rapid that the textbooks can hardly begin to keep pace with the movement. But in this particular field, there's only one book ever given and never any supplements to it. We've had 2,000 years to concentrate on it and understand it hopefully better now than we did before, though a great many misunderstandings have perverted its message and one has to spend a great deal of time indicating what the Bible does not teach, if he's to make clear what it does teach, but we do have this incomparable pleasure of knowing that in that book, that textbook, we have a book written by God himself, the only book that was written by God. And as an addition to that, we have the very spirit who inspired it, dwelling in our hearts to help me understand it and, and teach it, and you to perceive what I'm saying and weigh it against the infallible truth of that book so as to come to an understanding yourself of the very Word of God. And that prayer is our main means of communication with the author of that book and therefore the ability to understand that book. In true prayer, number two, man speaks to God. When I say man, I mean Christian man. You cannot have access to God except through Jesus Christ. As we said in our discussion of the Incarnation, there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. So when I say here in true prayer, man speaks to God, it goes without saying that he speaks to God through Jesus Christ. You can cast yourself on God's mercy. You can beg him to forgive your sins, and he may be pleased to hear you. 
but you have no access to him as your father. You cannot commune with him except through his son. That is his appointed way. But through his son, Jesus, we are able to speak with the author of that book. His is an infallible message to us. Ours is a very infallible, very fallible response to him. But it is a response. And the, as we mentioned before, the fallibility and the faults of our prayers are removed by the great intercessor who makes our appeal to heaven to be heard and wonderfully answered. Number three, God is a prayer-hearing God, Psalm 65 tells us. Can he who made the ear not hear, asks Isaiah. One thing is immediately evident. God can hear prayer. The only question is whether he wants to. It may surprise you to learn that there have been people who thought that God's in an isolated splendor far beyond the petty anxieties of this world of his creatures, and he can't, as it were, be bothered with our little petitions. So the question is whether he wants to hear us. No doubt he is capable of understanding who himself created the human understanding. But does he want to? Men can hear, but often they don't want to. But the Scripture tells us that God also wants to hear true prayer, John 4, 23. And number four, I point out, in fact, he wants to hear it more than men want to voice it. Now here, let me criticize myself a bit. I remind you once again that though we're moving ahead topic by topic in our handout theology, we are also casting glances backwards and occasionally forward as we try to keep the whole picture as far as possible before us. Now when I make a statement such as that, God desires to hear prayer more than Christian people want to make the prayer, immediately, if you're sensitive to earlier statements about the deity, you could very well ask if I haven't nodded at this point and said something which is not accurate in the light of our earlier discussions about the deity. God desires more, prayer more, than Christians desire to offer it. God desires to hear prayer, shall we say, to hear prayer more than Christians desire to offer it. Now, if this were an informal class and I had you right in my possession and I could throw the ball in your court and ask you a question, this would be the question, is that a correct statement? If it isn't, what's wrong with it? Well, you should say there's something wrong with that. It doesn't feel right. Let me think around about it and so on. But you see, if it's strictly true that God desires to hear more than we desire to offer prayer, then it looks as if we'd have a frustrated deity. He has all this unsatisfied desire of his. You know, that's wrong. God is never frustrated. He's the infinitely, perfectly, eternally happy person. He has never had a moment of misery in his entire everlasting existence. So there can't be something which God desires which he doesn't possess. So that statement, as it stands there, in the ball, as it were, has to be wrong, and it is wrong in that sense of the word. Let me try to explain what I meant by that. I say he is more willing <coughs> to hear us than we are willing to petition him. Would that correct the situation? 
What I'm trying to say, obviously, is, uh, in the light of our Lord's statement in John 4 there, that God desires to have them worship Him, who worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, what that means is that He gladly receives you, and He has a perfect joy in your presence, whereas you have an only imperfect joy in His presence. But His desire is to have you, and His desire to have you is what led to your being born again in accordance with His eternal election of you, which caused Him to pour His Spirit out in your heart and to stir up the same desire in you so that when you kneel to pray, it is God who has inclined you to pray. It's His desire to have you call upon Him that has created the desire in your heart which leads you to call upon Him. And His desire is a perfect desire, whereas yours is a very finite and imperfect desire. But it is true that He does have an infinite desire, and you provide only a finite satisfaction of it. But, but, what saves this kind of situation, if you understand it, is that God is able to extract from a finite gift of prayer, as it were, an infinite satisfaction, so that He suffers no frustration. He is able to take your two loaves and few fishes and multiply them infinitely, so that they are the actual occasion for an infinite delight in God, which you are participating in your finite measure. So to sum up my critique and sort of answer to my own critique here, when we say God desires to hear prayer more than Christians desire to offer it, if that is taken to mean that they never actually give a infinite response to God's desire and therefore leave God frustrated, the answer is that that is only superficially the case. When you understand what happens here, God actually does extract an infinite satisfaction by His power from your very imperfect and finite prayers. And moreover, it is His very desire which accounts for your having a desire for Him. You wouldn't desire to pray if He didn't first desire to have you pray. Your prayer, in other words, is a response to His desire and an outworking of His desire and in no way a frustration of His desire. Number four, in fact, He wants to hear it more than men want to voice it. The one who has everything and needs nothing wants to hear from the ones who have nothing and need everything, and it's the latter who restrain prayer. Yeah, I think all of this contrast is justified as long as you'll remember that exposition. Otherwise, you could easily read into this that I'm lapsing from my basic beliefs in the absolute sufficiency of God and the perfect felicity of God by this kind of language when I contrast the meagerness of our desire to exploit this uh, unimaginable opportunity with the infinite desire that God gets out of your prayers, feeble and faulty as they actually are. And I point out, it's man who restrains prayer. This passage in Job 15 indicates a person who's been touched by God, influenced by God, but shows by his subsequent restraining of prayer that the Spirit acted upon him but not in him. He was never converted, though, as in Hebrews 6, he tasted of things to come, and he was a partaker of the Holy Spirit in the sense of having an encounter with him. But in spite of all that, his old corruption takes over, and he restrains or gives up prayer, and the giving up of prayer is the same thing as indicating that you never did pray, and you never did know God, and you never did actually have a saving experience of Him. But the incredible contrast, you see, still stands. Here, as I say, 
Here, here's a God who has everything. You can't add anything to him. That full bucket problem we've talked about, you know, you can understand how some people would say he dwells in isolated splendor, he needs nothing, and so on. Here a God who needs nothing and has everything is not only inviting us, he's virtually twisting our arm to come into his presence. The contrast is there, and of course it's all to the glory of God that he has such an infinite love for such unworthy beings, but the shock of our so meager response considering such an incredible invitation stays with us. Five, imagine that. Among men it is those who have most and need least who are besieged. Those who have nothing and need everything never stop begging. I've known a few rich people in my life and they tell me about this, an incredible flow of requests they get from people. It never stops. They have so much more than the generality. These people are always begging favors, asking contributions, gifts, helps, whatever, and so on. Here is the one who has everything. Willing to hear anybody. Promises to give abundantly above anything they can even ask or think. And his throne isn't even besieged. People who have had an encounter with him stop praying, and others never pray all their lives. This is sort of condescending from the sublime to the ridiculous, but I can't help but remember once when I was in Asiut, Egypt, and I was speaking through a, con uh, through a translator to a school in Asiut, Egypt. And I told the old story about the man who was on a boat in a little lake which encountered a sudden and dangerous storm. And the man cried out in his peril and said, God, I haven't called on your name in 40 years. And I promise, if you'll hear me now, I won't bother you again as long as I live. Well, I noticed that my TV operator back there smiled at that particular point, but when I mentioned that to about six or 800 students at ASU, there wasn't a single smile. Not only no laughter, not even a smile. Now, I know that wasn't brand new, though I think it was somewhat new to Egypt, but uh, you can imagine how uncomfortable I was with that stolid response. I wondered whether the man was translating me or whether people heard me. They were all sitting very politely and nobody was fidgeting or talking or reading anything. They were all seemingly glued to what I was saying. Not a smile. So, uh, well, I asked after the service was over, what in the world was the explanation? Nobody saw any su surprise about it. I, I was totally dumbfounded. I asked afterward. It was the way the man translated me. The man, they, they, they've never heard that kind of uh, humor, that sort of thing that is sort of common in the States and in Europe, but not in the Orient. And the translator just didn't know what to do with it. And he translated it as saying, the man cried out, I haven't called upon your name in 40 years, and I promise if you hear me now, I'll be faithful to you for the rest of my life. <laughs> I never bother you again all my life is translated, I'll be faithful to you all the rest of my life. Yeah, that's a, the Hollywood ending that they were so addicted to that that's the only thing they could say. But I'm, I only mention that banal incident simply to point out that the Egyptians apparently can't even understand a person not praying or once starting ceasing to pray. In that sense, they're profoundly rational. You could see how they would be incredulous before the proposition that a man would pray and then promise never to pray again, and so on. It doesn't go with it. And I say it's a part of this incongruity that this God who has everything will let us ask him and promises to hear and promises to give more than we could ask and so on, and we restrain prayer. His throne is not besieged. 
It's an incredible proposition indeed. It's no wonder the translator didn't know what to do with that kind of phenomenon. Number seven, since God does not need men or their prayers, why would he listen? Because he is love, and love is outgoing, not self-centered. Now, you see, at that particular point, I'm making a very summary, dogmatic statement that I labored, I guess, for 15 or 20 minutes to try to explain more fully in the earlier lectures here. Now I think I can give it to you bluntly like this uh, with some confidence that you would understand from what is said before how I can say such a thing as this. Number seven, since God does not need men or their prayers, why would he listen? The answer is because he's love, and love is outgoing, not self-centered. Remember, we touched on that problem earlier, that if God actually needs the prayers and the adoration and the service of God, and if that's what actually led God to create man, because God is not sufficient in himself, that he has to create persons for the purpose of adoring him, that would, of course, and people like uh, uh, Spinoza and others have suggested things like this, that would, of course, utterly vitiate the concept of deity, a deity who is insufficient, is not the Lord God omnipotent who reigneth, who is very being, who brings all being into existence and is the source of all being in which it participates and so on. And yet here he is begging us to pray, twisting our arm, as I say, to come into his presence and worship him who can gain nothing by it and can only bless those who do it and so on. I say no insufficiency at all. It's a super sufficiency, as Edwards has spelled out, I think I mentioned, in his end or purpose for which God created the world. Not because God was insufficient and had to create it for his own well-being, but that God was super sufficient and created it for its well-being, so that the creature would be able to enter into the infinite felicity of the living God was the purpose of the creation, not because God needed the creation. So I can say very briefly, and I think, uh, trusting you'll understand it, since God does not need men or their prayers, why would he listen? Because he is love, and love is outgoing, not self-centered or insufficient. Number eight, best of all, he will not only listen, he will also answer. <laughs> Wouldn't it be a great deal of consolation, even though it might fill us with amazement that God would even listen, but just because he would listen, I don't think we would necessarily want to talk with him if he wouldn't listen to our petition. After all, we come to make our needs known before him, the forgiveness of our sins, the endowment of our daily bread, and such matters that we'll be coming to in the Lord's Prayer in a moment. We certainly uh, could be fascinated by the idea that we could talk with God, but the idea of talking with the God who has everything and not uh, have any assurance that he would hear us and our needs who have nothing and would bless us by it would probably be fatal to a life of prayer. So we're glad to realize he's not only a prayer hearing God, but he is a prayer answering God. Number nine, if you can imagine his hearing, you can't imagine his answering. It is beyond anything we can ask or think. That's the way the apostle puts it, you remember. All right, we can imagine because he tells us that he is a prayer-answering God. We have an answering service in heaven there. The Lord not only hears, but he actually answers. But what I'm suggesting in this proposition, that even when we know that, you can see that we couldn't imagine how he would answer it. It would almost be redundant on Paul's part to tell us it would be beyond anything we can think or ask, we're addressing the deity now. He not only knows what we're going to say before we say it, in a certain sense, as I've already indicated, it has a good deal to do with our actually saying it, but of course, when he answers, he answers in the infinite style, manifestly. Though I utter a petty human need petition, 
I'm addressing an infinite God who can answer far beyond anything I could ever imagine. It's like the story I read in the Reader's Digest years ago about this British journalist, you know, who traveled in India where he met one of these fabulously wealthy maharajas who weighed himself against diamonds. And the journalist had some trinket or other that the maharaja wanted very badly. And he asked the journalist for it, who gave it to him very casually. And uh, the maharaja was overwhelmed with gratitude and he just wanted to know how he could show his appreciation. <laughs> the journalist was embarrassed by it. He says, it's nothing. Your thanks are quite sufficient. Now, I don't need anything. So he went back, this journalist did, to England. And sometime later, the Maharaja was, oh yeah, I forgot a part of the detail. He said uh, the journalist to get rid of the man more than anything else because, as I say, he was embarrassed at so, so profuse gratitude for such a trifling gift and so on. So as I say, to get rid of the Maharaja, he said, all right, sometime when you're traveling, pick me up a golf club. So some months later, the story went on that this Maharaja was traveling in Britain. And it wasn't long after that that this journalist who had given him the trinket got a telegram from the Maharaja saying, I bought you two golf clubs. They, one of them has a swimming pool. I tried to buy St. Andrews, but they wouldn't sell. See, for a Maharaja, a niblick is a whole course, and so on. But we are addressing the maker and breaker of Maharajas. And if you can't imagine what a man of inestimable worth would give when he's grateful, you certainly can't imagine what God would give when we ask him. You would know it would have to be beyond anything we ask or think, and that underlines our obligation that we stressed before to watch these prayers, to be on the alert, as Peter says, to see how they are answered. Finally, number 10, that is the reason it is often unnoticed and acknowledged. I have to end on that gloomy note there that grows right out of this marvelous splendor that we've been talking about. God not only hears, but he answers beyond anything we can ask or think, but precisely because we offer these meager petitions and are thinking in terms of some humdrum response to them, when the answer comes in such a splendid way as God is prone to answer, we don't even notice it instead of being overwhelmed with gratitude because it so transcended our aspirations when we actually besiege the throne of grace, we don't realize the prayer has been answered. I've had that experience. I'm sure you have. Hitting his head months afterwards, they, I had been asking for that all on here. I'm totally surprised when such and such a thing happens. So let's be careful not to forget the infinite sufficiency of our God when he bends his ear to our petitions.